In this lesson, we're looking at PCR and gel electrophoresis. So we're specifically looking to explain their purposes, which is quite easy, so we're going to learn a little bit more about them as well. Right, most biotechnology techniques require working with large quantities of DNA. For example, we can't just take one target gene to a bacterial plasmid to make recombinant DNA. We need huge numbers of those target genes. So for techniques used in forensics or extraction of you know DNA from fossils, tiny quantities of DNA need to be amplified and reproduced many, many times to be properly studied. PCR is a tool that is used to amplify DNA quantities. So PCR stands for polymerase chain reaction, and it uses a polymerase enzyme to mimic the natural process of DNA replication. So recall that DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase are the enzymes which elongate the newly made DNA or RNA strand in replication or transcription. So essentially to boost the numbers of DNA strands available for these biotechs, PCR mimics that natural process, but in vitro, so outside the cell. There are three main steps in the process of PCR, denaturation, annealing, and extension. And denaturation is exactly as it sounds. First, the DNA sample is denatured by heating it up to about 95 degrees. It breaks the hydrogen bonds, holding together each strand of the DNA. During annealing, the sample is cooled down to around 50 or 60 degrees, and these small little primers are annealed to the DNA strands. So annealed means stick to in a complementary fashion there. So primers are really short starting DNA sequences they're complementary to that beginning sequence of the specific target gene. So when we lower the temperature, what it does, it allows for the hydrogen bonds to form between the primers and the DNA strand in the nucleotides there. Now, eventually during extension, DNA polymerase and free nucleotides, they're all added into the sample and it's heated slowly to a bit over 70 degrees. And the DNA polymerase binds to the primer and synthesizes a new DNA strand. Now, you might remember that you know, enzymes, they denature at really high temperatures. So the polymerase that's used has to work at these high temperatures. We're talking 75 to 80 degrees here. So TAC polymerase is often used and it comes from a thermophile bacteria. So it's, you know, works really well in high temperatures. Um, it's known as thermus aquaticus and its optimum working temperature is around 75 to 80 degrees. So eventually a new DNA strand uh, will be created that's complementary to the template DNA strand. Now this whole process has been automated and will take place inside of a thermocycler. And this allows the three steps, the denaturation, the annealing and the extension to occur over and over again. Hence the chain reaction part of the PCR name. So the DNA numbers can be substantially amplified. And you can see here that after 25 cycles, you have about 33 million uh, pieces of DNA there. So it's important to be really mindful uh, when working with PCR samples as to not contaminate them with your own cells as there's a chance that you're going to amplify the wrong DNA alongside the bit that you want. PCR is routinely used in medical diagnostics for tissue typing, for transplants. Um, they use really small samples of fetal DNA for prenatal screening, for forensics um, to amplify small quantities of DNA, uh, you know, to find suspects, victims, people present at crime scenes. It can analyze bacterial and viral infections to serotype or find what strain of a virus is being spread around. Sound familiar? Uh, and it can be used to amplify quantities of DNA that are extracted from fossilized remains to study a phylogenetic right? Now it's a tool that is the first step in a substantial number of other biotech techniques. And one of those is gel electrophoresis. And this is a process whose purpose is to separate fragments of DNA or other macromolecules according to their size and electrical charge. It can be used to visualize a unique DNA profile, which shows up as banding patterns in a gel that can be analyzed. So it's often used in forensics and criminal cases. It can be used as a tool uh, to prove familial relationships, um, both in things like inheritance and paternity, but also in species relatedness and classification. Now, gel electrophoresis relies on the idea that DNA has this overall negative charge due to a phosphate group in its backbone. So samples of fragmented DNA are placed inside a gel that at the molecular level has a whole heap of cross-linked matrix of fibers, right? And this is then placed into a liquid buffer and electricity is run through it. And the gel acts as like a little sponge and it's a medium where all the fragments of DNA can move through it and separate out as they move through towards the positive anode, all right? And the larger fragments Fragments meet resistance in the gel, right? They're too big to move through it easily, so they travel the least. The smaller fragments meet very little resistance and they travel the furthest towards the anode. 
Now, before samples are placed into the wells of the gel, they have to be treated with a restriction enzyme to cleave the DNA into those small fragments. And the DNA samples are then loaded into really small wells into the gel, and they're placed into this liquid buffer full of ions, and that maintains the pH and the electrical current. And once the electrical charges run through the gel, the sample in the wells will run down the gel in parallel lines, uh, lanes, lines, whatever. And the, the DNA samples may not actually be visible. So sometimes they're loaded up with a dye, either a stain or a fluorescent dye as well. And other times the gel itself is actually stained. So at the end of the run, the bands of separated DNA fragments can be uh, viewed and analyzed. Now a control sample is also used. It's run simultaneously at the, you know, the start of the run, which consists of fragments of known size. And this means that once the patient samples are finished separating, the bands can be compared to the molecular size markers um, of the control. But in a situation, say in a forensic situation, you might actually need your control to be, say, the DNA found at the crime scene, so that when you are running different suspects or whoever, then you can actually compare whose is whose. And we can clearly see that suspect two seems to match the bands on the crime scene DNA. Now, in terms of looking at familial relationships of offspring and two parents, the offspring receives alleles from both the parents. So they have a combination of fragments seen in both the parents. So essentially every band um, that, that that child here should have should be accounted for in both the mother and the father. And this can be upscaled to apply to phylogenetics when investigating relatedness of organisms um, to others for more precise classification. Now, gels are notoriously difficult to run correctly, and they're really hard to interpret as well. They aren't always the most conclusive pieces of evidence, and PCR can become contaminated and cause erroneous results as well. So gels can be difficult to see if the fluorescent markers don't work. Having said that, they are a really excellent tool uh, to separate that DNA and get some kind of analysis uh, to compare that DNA sample. So remember, our job here is to explain the purpose of PCR and gel electrophoresis.